the Cavalcade of America. Tonight's star, Basil Rathbone. Good evening, everyone. This is Bill Hamilton bringing you greetings as the Cavalcade of America starts its 16th season. In our story tonight, Basil Rathbone appears as John Adams, attorney for the defense, in one of the most famous murder trials in our history. Please. The clerk will continue. It is here charged that the aforesaid defendants, eight in number, and soldiers of the crown, not having the fear of God before their eyes, but being moved and seduced by the instigation of the devil and their own wicked hearts, did on the fifth day of March with force and arms feloniously, willfully, and of their malice aforethought, do unto death the aforesaid five citizens of Boston Town. The prisoners have heard the indictment. How do they plead? Not guilty. Not guilty. God sends you good deliverance. Let the trial proceed. The story of this famous American murder trial is told by the attorney for the defense. For it is his story, too. His name? John Adams. That same John Adams who was one day to become the second president of the United States. They were innocent under the law, those eight British soldiers, and I knew it. Yet to plead their cause in the year 1770 was the most difficult task I ever undertook. I think the story might well begin on an early summer evening two years before the trial. Abigail and I had a guest for dinner at our house in Brattle Street, Boston, my closest friend, Jonathan Sewell. Ah, an excellent wine, John. Excellent. Where did he get it, Abby? Uh, some of John Hancock's contraband treasure, the wine of liberty. Now, Mr. Sewell, no politics, please. Oh, nonsense, my dear Abby. I may be a king's man, I am a Tory, and I glory in it. But my political convictions do not extend to smuggled Madeira. In a vintage so fine, I'll drink to either party. <laughs> I wish I could view our present trouble so lightly, Jonathan. Oh, John. John, my friend. When will you ever learn to unbend a little? Can't you teach him, Abigail? I'd not care to try, Mrs. Hewell. I'd not want to try, sir. <laughs> well, perhaps I can make the attempt. We'll see. I uh, have news for you, John. Yes, I thought you might by the gleam in your eye. Abby, I would you mind? I was about to see to the children, John. Uh, good night, Mr. Sewell. Good night, dear lady. You'll kiss little Abby good night for me and John Quincy, too. Oh, yes, indeed. Well, John? Well, Jonathan? I won't beat about the bush, my old friend. I've been sent by Governor Bernard to offer you the post of Advocate General in the King's Admiralty Court of Massachusetts. What? Now, 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 don't bridle and draw back like an offended maiden. <laughs> It means your fortune is made, man. It means I should sit in judgment on my friends who have avoided the king's tax and grow rich upon their substance. It means new friends, John. Friends who have the ear of the king himself. Who are your precious friends now, these so-called sons of liberty? Her penniless adventurers. John Hancock, James Otis, Dr. Warren, Ben Eddies of the Gazette, my cousin Samuel... Some of the most substantial men in our colony. Oh, no, Sam Adams is a dockside demagogue, a tattered ne'er-do-well, a troublemaker. Jonathan, you too are my friend. I have none closer or more dear, so you must have known my answer would be no. I cannot change my political principles. But His Excellency mentioned that point to me most especially. He desired me to say that your political sentiments will be no objection, no objection whatever. He offers you the post merely because you are the best qualified. It was a bribe, and I knew it. An attempt to break the ranks of the royal governor's opponents. But I couldn't accuse my old friend of trying to bribe me, or of supposing I could be bribed. We talked late and long. He made me promise to consult my wife. And when he had gone, I found Abby waiting at our bedroom window. I told her, and she said... Yes, John, it is a bribe. Of course it is. A high bribe, a good price, easy to take. Yes, and more would follow. You could be Chief Justice, Sir John Adams. The court party fears my husband. 
Do you want me to take the post, my dear? John, are you testing me? You know that isn't necessary. Just as I know you'll always refuse such offers. Oh, my friend, my partner. They say you're an ambitious man. Is it not something of a satisfaction to be so feared by the powerful? It is. It is indeed. And beloved by such a wise and lovely lady as well. There's a gift no king could offer. My, Jonathan was wrong. You can unbend on the proper occasion. Listen, the watchman must be very late. All is well, but a storm is brewing in Boston town, a blow to put the stars out. Somehow, Abby, somehow I'm afraid I rejoice in the coming storm, and I hate it too. It will clear the air. There'll be brighter stars ahead, I think. All men knew that trouble was near in Massachusetts. Before long, there were 4,000 British soldiers quartered upon us in Boston. One to each four inhabitants. The king's taxes threatened the livelihood of every man. A powder keg. Yes, a powder keg with a long fuse. Among the Sons of Liberty, there were those who counseled moderation. I was one of them. And there were the firebrands. My cousin Sam was their leader. I remember he said... John, we're proud of you. To stand fast and refuse a certain fortune. How did you know? Jonathan Sewell told no one but me. (laughs) Sons of Liberty have ways of knowing. Your loyalty will be rewarded, cousin, in the future. If I thought of rewards, I'd have taken the crown post. And if you take my advice, Sam, you'll move more slowly. If violence must come, let it not be said that we began the open quarrel. I say but this. Break no law. The law is my guide. But whose law? The king's law? No. The ancient common law of England by which we live. If we break it, we're lost. The law is our most precious weapon, Sam. I've heard of weapons that speak louder. You ask me to hold back the inevitable thunder, to stem the very tide of great events. The sons of liberty are prepared to seize the tide at the flood and move on to freedom and glory. Now we wait upon events to be sure. But perhaps we can shape events a little, or more than a little. The flood tide, cousin, is almost here. The time to tread softly has passed. I never liked the tolling bells of Boston, preferring the quiet of our stony acres at Braintree. But Abby loved the voice of the bells. Christ church bell, she said, made a lordly sound. The new north chime was out of tune. King's chapel rang out deep and slow, as if it had to tell a story. Cheer, Abby. Ah, how like a woman's fancy. But soon the lordly bells were to make a new sound. A savage sound. Alarm bells ringing in the night as for fire. For the flood tide came as Cousin Sam said it would. In a waterfront rope walk at lunch hour, English soldiers and Boston workmen exchanged obscenities and unforgivable blows were struck. The next morning a poster appeared, tacked up in a dockside tavern. It read... This is to inform the rebellious people in Boston that the soldiers in the 14th and 29th regiments are determined to join together and defend themselves against all who shall oppose them. Sign the soldiers of the 14th and 29th regiments. Well, 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 we'll see about that. Yes, we'll see about that. Bloody lobster backs. Who posted that notice? Was it truly the soldiers? Or might it have been that mysterious gentleman in the red cloak and white wig who was everywhere on that fatal day? No one will ever know. But as night falls, strolling crowds of Liberty boys begin to fill the streets. 
Bob is apprentice and sulks a sentinel. The sentinel gives chase. Whacks the boy with the butt of his musket. It snowballs and ice begin to fill the air. An oyster shell, sharp, dangerous as razor blades. As if on a signal, the alarm bells break out. and white wiggers everywhere, urging on the rioters. Captain Preston, commanding the guard, brings seven men to rescue the sentinel. The crowd presses in. One of the soldiers is hit by an oyster shell. Slips on the ice and falls. His gun goes off in the air. There is no order to fire, but this is the high tide. Here is the powder, and here is the prince. This is the inevitable hour, and the spark is struck. were dead, two mortally wounded. Quickly the red-clad regiments poured into the streets, bayonets glistening in the moonlight. The alarm bells ceased as suddenly as they had begun. By three in the morning, Boston was quiet again. Next day, I found Cousin Sam and Ben Eddy's editor of the Gazette, waiting for me at my office. Sean, we need your advice, as ever it seems. It may be too late now, Ben. I see the streets are filling up with armed men. Sam, surely you'll not carry this thing any further? No, John, enough is enough. But the farm lads are flocking in. Get them home. That's my advice. Get them quickly home. Uh, Sam, who was the man in the red cloak and white wig? Cousin, I'll thank you not to peer down your great nose at me in that fashion. This is my only cloak. And it's black, rusty, and threadbare enough, as you see. Uh, Ben... See who that is. Look through the window. Mr. Forrester, the man they call the Irish infant, a friend of Captain Preston. Let him in, Ben. Mr. Adams, Mr. Adams, thanks be to God and his angels, I found you in. Oh, man, it is a terrible thing, a terrible thing. What is your business, Mr. Forrester? I come from Captain Preston, sir. He's in great danger. He and his men will be tried at once for murder itself. All the great Tory lawyers have refused his case in fear of their precious necks. Captain Preston wants you to defend him, sir. As God is my witness, John Adams, those men are innocent. They but saved their own skins in the night, confronted and threatened by the yelling mob. Yes. Yes. They were at their posts, on duty. They are innocent. They acted in self-defense. John, you can't do this. You ruined your career. By refusing the governor's bribe, you lost all royal favor. By doing this thing, you'll be cursed forever by men on our side. The side for liberty, your own party. You risked your very life defending these massacring British soldiers. You can't do it, John. I can and I will. Those men are innocent and you know it. They cannot be denied a defender. Mr. Eddies? Yes, John? The Gazette today will kindly announce that John Adams will defend the king's soldiers now lying in jail under capital charges. The rule of justice, you may say, not mob rule, must prevail in Boston town. Come along, Forrester. We'll talk to the prisoners. You are listening to The Cavalcade of America, starring Basil Rathbone. We continue The Cavalcade of America with Basil Rathbone as John Adams. In Colonial Boston, a great murder trial is taking place. The lives of eight British soldiers are at stake. John Adams, risking the ruin of his career, perhaps his life, is their counselor determined that justice shall be done. Our first move was to get a postponement of trial. Let the passions of my fellow townsmen cool a bit. Young Josiah Quincy was my associate in the case, and together we found half a hundred Bostonians calm enough to remember what actually happened that night. 
When the trial began, we had 96 witnesses against us. Honest men, guided not by reason, but by emotion. Telling what they thought had happened. One by one, they took the stand. Day in, day out. There came in seven soldiers from the main guard without any coats on. Driving along, swearing and cursing like wild creatures. Crying, slay the Yankee, slay them all. I say Private Kilroy's bayonet was thick with dried blood, up to three inches from the point. Three inches of blood. I saw it with my own eyes. Three bloody inches. Then our turn came. Hour by hour, the truth piled up on the word of our witnesses. Finally, Dr. Jeffries took the stand. He was uh, the physician who had attended young Patrick Carr, one of the slain citizens, in his dying hours. My colleague for the defense, Josiah Quincy, was examining. Now, Dr. Jeffries, <coughs> you visited young Carr, the innocent bystander, after he was injured. I did, Mr. Quincy, yes. What did you say to him? After dressing his wounds, I advised him never again to go into quarrels and riots. And what did he say? He agreed I had a good idea there. Told me also that he was a native of Ireland. That he had frequently seen mobs and soldiers called upon to quell them. I see. Now... He said more. Oh, go on, Doctor. He said that never in all his life had he seen soldiers bear so much abuse before they were forced to fire... Upon a mob in self-defense. My lord, I object. Witness is expressing him. Order. Order, please. We sustain the crowd. Proceed, Mr. Quincy. <clears throat> now, uh, how long did Patrick Carr live after he received his wound? Ten days, almost to the minute. And when had you a last conversation with him? Uh, about four o'clock in the afternoon of the day he died. And what did this dying boy say to you? He said... I forgive the man who shot me, whoever he is. As God will judge me soon, that soldier fired only to save himself from certain death. And then with a prayer in my heart that our months of toil might have just reward, I heard his lordship declare, Mr. John Adams will sum up the cause of the defendant. May it please your lordships, and you gentlemen of the jury, I am for the prisoners at the bar and shall apologize for it only in the words of a great Italian jurist, the Marquis of Beccaria. He said, if I can be but the instrument of preserving one life, his blessing upon my head shall be a sufficient consolation to me for the contempt of all mankind. We talk much of liberty and property. But if we cut up the law of self-defense, we cut away the foundation of both. Place yourselves in the situation of Kilroy or the sentry with the people shouting, Kill them! Kill them! On heaving snowballs, oyster shells, clubs, heavy birch sticks. Consider yourselves in the situation and then decide if a reasonable man would not consider they were going to kill him. The law considers a man as capable of bearing anything and everything but blows. I may reproach a man as much as I please. I may call him a thief, a robber, lobster bag. And if he kills me, it will be murder. But if from giving him such kind of language I proceed to molest his person, that is an assault. That is a blow. The law will not oblige a man to stand still and bear it. There is the distinction. Hands off. Touch me not. As soon as you touch me then, if I run you through the heart, it is but manslaughter. The law reads, he who on an assault retreats to the wall beyond which he can go no further before he kills the other is judged to act upon the other. As I said to you yesterday, I proceed lest his person... How long has he been talking now? Since 11 o'clock yesterday oh, morning. It's 4 o'clock almost now. One, Nearly 12 four, hours three, yesterday and today. Well, he can't talk yeah. much longer now. Oh, Father, to use the words of Algernon Sidney, a law no passion can disturb. Tis void of desire and fear. 
Rust. <coughs> and anger. It is written reason. Retaining some measure of the divine perfection. Our law commands that which is good and punishes evil in all. Whether rich or poor, high or low. It is death, inexorable, inflexible. So Sidney wrote, law here on the one hand is inexorable to the cries and lamentations of these prisoners. On the other hand, it is death, death as an adder to the clamors of the populace of Boston. Gentlemen of the jury, to your candor and justice, I submit the prisoners and their cause. Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. And what is your verdict? The soldiers, William Wems, James Hartigan, William McCauley, Hugh White, William Warren, and John Carroll are not guilty. <laughs> soldiers Matthew Kilroy and Hugh Montgomery are not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter. Your Lordship, Your Lordship, on behalf of the two defendants, Kilroy and Montgomery, Proved guilty of manslaughter, I ask the benefit of clergy. An archaic but perfectly legal plea, Mr. Adams. It is granted. They will be set free after they've been branded in the thumb. It is our usage that this be done at once. The bailiff will prepare the fire and the iron. And the court will please remain in order. <laughs> Well, Abby, it's over. Over and won, over and done. Oh, I'm proud of you, John. I did what I had to do, but what now? My day in the courts of this colony is over. Would you like to be a poor farmer's wife, Abby? I'd be quite content. But I don't believe that'll be necessary. You've won a greater victory than you suppose, my dear. I saved the lives of eight innocent men. That's enough. I, I made 12 good men and true see the right according to law and declare it. That's quite enough. But you did more. You won the minds and the hearts and the goodwill of the people of Massachusetts. Perhaps the people are wiser than you think, John. They will not make you suffer for having upheld their laws so well. And by God's grace and her own wisdom, Abby was right. A few years later, I wrote in my diary, there is a new and grand scene opened before me, a congress. I had been elected to that Congress by the people of Massachusetts, and the bells of Boston rang out in celebration as we set out for Philadelphia with Cousin Samuel and me, reunited again in the great cause of liberty and on the cushion of a fine coach. Cousin, I said, uh, that's the most impressive red cloak you're wearing. You like it, Cousin? It was given me just last week by the Sons of Liberty. <laughs> it is most becoming. You are quite sure it is a new one, Cousin? Oh, yes, Cousin. Quite sure. Sure. You see, I always wanted a red cloak. Uh, drive more slowly, boy. The people wish to see us. And have you reflected, cousin, we may be driving towards a gallows tree? I have thought much of the king's rope, cousin, but not too much. And you, John, you're still with us? To the end. Whatever that may be, I have crossed over my river. I have passed my Rubicon. I will never change, sink or swim, survive or perish, I am with my country. Joins in applauding Basil Rathbone and the Cavalcade players for their performances tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, the star of tonight's Cavalcade of America, Basil Rathbone. Thank you. I just want to say, first off, that I enjoyed being here tonight, this opening night of the new season. Good night now. Tonight's original drama was written by George H. Faulkner and was taken from an incident in the historical biography John Adams and the American Revolution by Catherine Drinker Bowen, published by Little Brown and Company. The music for The Cavalcade of America was composed by Arden Cornwell and conducted by Donald Vores. The program is directed by John Zoller.
The Cavalcade of America comes to you from the Velasco Theater in New York. Three times mean good times on NBC.